Hello, everyone, and welcome to Conscious Conversion. I am so thrilled to have you listening today, and I'm also thrilled to introduce you to today's guest, the amazing, the beautiful Jenna Herbert. She is a serial entrepreneur, speaker, and writer. She founded The Make It Show in 2008, which has grown to be one of Canada's largest craft fairs with biannual events in Vancouver and Edmonton. Make It provides a platform for hundreds of artists and makers, she also calls them makeys, to earn a living doing what they love. Jenna is the author of Make It Happen, a guidebook for entrepreneurs on how to turn their ideas into a business. She also runs an event space in Vancouver called Conscious Lab that hosts events around mindfulness and self-development for entrepreneurs. Jenna lives in Vancouver with her fiance, Orson, and they are expecting their first child in October. <laughs> Yay! They're currently practicing parenthood with their ridiculously adorable kitten, Biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Congratulations. Thank you, Sarah. I, I'm thrilled to be here chatting with you today. So awesome. I love, I love kittens and they are almost as good as babies. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I think it's a good practice step because you have to take care of them. They're a little rambunctious, but yeah, that kitten energy is definitely a lot of fun. Yeah. And yeah. And then like a lot more poop. Well, because I'm pregnant, I have the perfect <laughs> excuse not to do the poop. So Lucky Orson is the poop guy. I, I, I feed Little Biscuit and then he scoops the poop. So I think I got the, the right end of the deal on that one. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Um, you're going to make an amazing mom. I can tell. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So tell me, lovely lady, what kind of impact do you want to make in the world over the course of the next five years? <laughs> Oh, I'm starting with big questions. Um, <laughs> my my impact's always been around entrepreneurs and you know working with creative entrepreneurs through the Make It community. And right now, I'm looking to to expand that to just include entrepreneurs who want to make a difference and thought leaders and, and people who who want to make change. And I'm particularly fond of helping women because I feel like. We, we do face a lot of disadvantages that, that men maybe just don't understand. Um, mm. So yeah, I, I just, I want to be a positive role model for female entrepreneurs. And I think business can be done in a different way because I went to business school way back in the day and like what they teach you there, it is applicable, but there's this whole other side of business, like more the feminine energy side, more the manifestation and I, I think they come together in a really beautiful way. We need both. We can't just be like doing, 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 slaving away. Um, uh, you'll just get burnt out. And you also can't just sit on your meditation cushion wanting it to happen because you, you also have to, you have to put in that, that disciplined energy to, to make the things happen. So I'm really interested in this, this combination of the two energies coming together. That is amazing. I love that. Um... I love that for so many reasons. One, because I know when I started this um, ads agency, that was a big intention of mine was to sort of bring that more feminine energy into, into business as much as possible. But especially now in the, given the, the super polarized world we live in, my next intention or my current intention is to, to step into sort of that, that integration, you know? And so I love, I love that you brought that up, that integration of the, the masculine style and the feminine style. It's beautiful. And I think now the world is realizing, especially with, with COVID, that those two energies are so needed together. And I think that the feminine energy, when it comes to anything, has been downplayed a lot because mm. people, especially people in the West, don't really understand it. It seems a little woo-woo, a little mystic, a little ungrounded. But I think that's the way of the future because obviously with capitalism and how we've been structuring our businesses, we're starting to see that it's just not sustainable. And I, I think we all understood that on an intellectual level and now we're starting to see it and feel it. So we'll, we'll be forced to pivot and change. And I actually, I'm excited for the generations, like for, for our daughters and their daughters and like all the, mm. the women and all the people that are, are coming, how they're going to start to look at the world in such a different way than we've been accustomed to seeing it. Totally. Yeah. There's so much potential right now. It's just, it's, it's magical. I'm wondering like how your business, especially since your business is um, a bit more sort of in this third dimensional reality than a lot of my clients who are more virtual. 
<laughs> and so I'm wondering how your business has pivoted and shifted um, since all this, this wild stuff has been going on the last couple months. It's, it's definitely been challenging and we're still not quite pivoted <laughs> because when you think about a pivot, like I always think about a car, it's like, eh, we're still in the turning part. Uh, I produce events for a living. So we were definitely impacted. We had to cancel our Edmonton show a week before it was supposed mm -hmm. to happen and make it like we have hundreds of artists. We get, you know, for a spring show, probably about 12,000 people through the door. So it was a pretty major announcement and devastating financially not only for me but all the makers who rely on the event to sell their work um, so it just I feel like right now we're being forced into the future faster than what feels comfortable but the ones that can can successfully pivot and change how they're thinking and realign in their business I think they're gonna be stronger than ever before so for make it like we're trying to create this online store of course taking way longer than I wanted it to um, but I want to do it right. And I think that's a balance that I struggle with sometimes is I'm, I'm a quick start. So I like to start things like now, today, but I don't always plan things out. So I'm starting to, to slow down a little bit. Maybe it's being pregnant. I don't know. Maybe it's having a kitten and just like having different things in my life right now. But um, to, to just create a platform where all the makers can sell online. And I'm also, I'm also looking into starting online courses and I'm actually launching my first one next week. Which is Ooh. Exciting. What's that? <laughs> tell, tell us about it. Sure. Yeah, it's called Make It Happen. And it's based on the book I wrote two years ago in 2018. And for a long time, I wanted to create a course around the book because I know how we consume content through books. Like you read it and then it's really easy to forget it. So this is just a deeper dive into what I taught in my book, which is the mindset around making something happen. And it, it's what, what I was saying earlier. It's that, you know, it's allowing things to happen, but still being pragmatic and taking action because that's just necessary. Like you, you just have to do certain things and it does it. It doesn't always feel good. And I think that's a misconception for a lot of entrepreneurs. It's like we want everything to feel good and to flow, and especially us that are more spiritual. It's like, oh, it should just be in alignment and flow. But sometimes it's just hard work. And sometimes you have to like roll up your sleeves. And I'm sure you know, Sarah, because you, you built a, a large business like with, with what you're doing. Like sometimes you just have to do the stuff that you don't always want to do. And that's also a spiritual practice in itself. Mm. But I think sometimes we get confused that like spiritual practices can sometimes not feel good, but that's where the growth really happens. There's so many metaphors there. And I always find that there's so many metaphors between business and life that it's just amazing. It's like its own little hero's journey or big. It doesn't, it's not a little, but it's a hero's journey <laughs> in and of itself of like, you know, of walking through the fire to get to your bliss, like the Joseph Campbell sort of, um, story. And I think that you're speaking to that beautifully. And I love that you've got a book and a course that sort of helps people along on that journey. And I agree that there are times where people will talk about like, you know, I'm even, you know, remember um, reading a book by a really prominent spiritual figure, entrepreneur figure that she said, like, everything you do should be easy. And, and that is definitely a one barometer of, of things for sure, yeah. but it shouldn't be the only barometer <laughs> because the most rewarding things in the world are definitely not easy, like having a baby. Like having a baby, <laughs> being in a relationship, like even traveling, like sitting in a plane for 18 hours to go to Bali or wherever, like it's not fun, but then you do it and then you get that reward. So I think, yeah, that term spiritual bypassing, I think that is a real thing. And I've been enjoying um, the Michael Jordan, The Last Dance um, documentary series on Netflix and just how he was such a ferocious warrior and everything he did. And he was the best player, but he also practiced the hardest. And I think that is so such an interesting idea. It's like, you know, you can be the best, but you also have to work the hardest. And, you know, even for him, like, it's just that discipline, that's what made him great. And I, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are afraid of, of diving in really deep and, and doing the work because it can be very revealing. Even writing my book, like, there were a lot of moments where I wanted to give up. And I had to go through a lot of just emotional stuff of, like, 
having something I created out there in the world and people can judge it and not everyone's going to like it. And it's my first time. I don't know. I don't know how to write a book. I've never done it before. So I, I really do feel that people who are able to get us to a certain level of success, they're, they're just able to, I don't know, for lack of a better word, like suck it up and, and get through those hard times and knowing that there will be glory and there will be victory on the other side, just like Joseph Campbell, like any of those, you know, any of those wheels of the hero's journey, like there's that facing the dragon and the slog part. And it's, you know, a movie wouldn't be interesting if there wasn't that element to it. Yeah. So what kind of people do you feel like resonate with you the most? Who are you writing to when you write your book and who are you creating your course for? Well, that's a great question. When I was writing my book, I channeled myself from 10 years ago, mm. little Jenna, when I first started my entrepreneurial journey. And I thought a lot about who, who I would want to follow and what information would have been insightful and impactful back then when I, well, I guess I started when I was pretty young, so maybe it was more than 10 years. But, but anyways, a, a version of myself that didn't really know anything because I feel like now I know we're, we're the same age, Sarah, because you just celebrated a, a birthday too. So, you know, being born in 81 and, and uh, like, we didn't really have the role models that are available now and we didn't ha have access to them. Like when we were in our early twenties, like it was just a different world. And so I think like, what would I be able to benefit from, from learning at that age? And I just try and channel that. Beautiful. I love that. So tell me uh, more about like your business. Um, I was going to say now, but now is such a precarious time. But how, how have you been and how do you continue to reach people organically? What's working for you in that department? Well, that's, a, that's another good question. At first, like when we started the Make It Show, I was in my mid-20s and I didn't really know what the hell I was doing. I just wanted to make a cool craft fair because before that I had an accessory line called Booty Belts and there Ooh. were these scarf belts that I, I designed. Uh, actually, when I was still in university, I, I was a business student and I came up with this plan for this, this booty belt business and then I launched it after I graduated. So I was selling my booty belts at at boutiques and some department stores and I did a lot of wholesaling right off the bat and then after a while the stores weren't reordering and I was feeling discouraged so I started selling them at street festivals so I traveled all over Canada selling at any music festival any outdoor festival any like craft fair I could and around that time you know because I was quite young I thought well a lot of these craft fairs are kind of lame and people my age don't really want to come to craft fairs so it gave me that idea of like, okay, well, what if they were rebranded? Like, what if it was cool and hip and we had good music and we had a bar and, and it was all just along the lines of what I selfishly wanted when I was selling my booty belts at events. And it was around the, it was just the right time because it's when Etsy was emerging and I was spending quite a bit of time in New York just seeing what the scene was like there. And I think we were able to reach people, or I know we were able to reach people because we were offering something different, but we weren't doing it in a really obnoxious salesy way. It was just that energy when you're excited about something, it's really transcendent. And I think when you're tapping into that, people feel it and people wanna be part of something new and exciting. So that's initially, and then later on, we had to do more traditional ads and you know, all the big things that you do to get people out to an event. But yeah, right off the bat, we didn't spend any money. Um, it was, I, I leveraged PR like crazy. Even when I was starting my booty belts, um, being in university, like I, I just understood storytelling and I understand how, understood how to leverage the media. And I figured like, oh, I'm a young woman, like making these booty belts out of my parents' basement after getting like a business degree. I just knew the key elements of storytelling and I just, you know, I just worked the shit out of that. I was shameless. I was just like, you know what? Re-advertising. And it's not only just re-advertising, it's a lot more authentic. And I think people pay attention to it a lot more. Um, yeah. So I would, I would tell any entrepreneur watching, like figure out how to do your own PR. Like it can be tempting to hire someone or, you know, it's not, it can be a bit unnerving doing it yourself, but it has so much value when you can figure it out. Amazing. And I like in that whole story that you just told that there was that uh, a revisiting of the, of the um, 
sort of the feminine, like you're channeling your business, you're channeling your marketing, all of this with the, you've got to work to make it happen and how that comes together. Because it's so true when you really, really are deeply aligned with what you're doing. And I talk about this all the time when you're super aligned and super enthusiastic and excited from a genuine place, like it shows it's effervescent. Everybody wants on board, but you know, you can't necessarily ride that every day, all day when you wake up in the morning and you're not feeling so well, or whenever there's dips in your income and you're like, I'm not feeling high vibe today, guys, you know? So that's when you've got to have those other things in place, you know, like Facebook ads or whatever. So there's got to be this sort of like this, this marriage of, of the, um, of the, of the channeling and the, uh, the, uh, the hard stuff, the execution. <laughs> totally. Totally. And, and, and another thing we did was the, the make, we call our exhibitors, but we didn't call them makeys back then. That was like pre makeys, which by the way, came about organically. We have this mascot that my brother, cause I started make it with my brother originally. And, and we ran the company for eight years together. And then I ended up buying him out. But anyways, he created this mascot and we wanted a name for our mascot and we ended up calling the mascot Makey. And then the people doing the show were referring to themselves as Makeys. So it was kind of cool just to see how that happened. Like we didn't purposely try and brand our exhibitors, but now it works brilliantly and we love it. Uh, but we really, we really encourage them and it was, it was both ways because we were offering something new. They were super excited. So they became like our guerrilla marketing force out there too because they were so pumped about doing the show that the word of mouth because they were telling all their customers and all their friends. So we really built it together as like this tribe. It wasn't just us promoting the show. It was everyone. And we just helped to facilitate that. So because I had a lot of experience with, with PR and, and storytelling, like I would – I would basically spoon feed them like the stories, like share this with your audience, like do this. And not only did that help their business, but it really helped our business too. So I think whenever you can make people that you serve, like your advocates, and again, you want to do this in a really organic, like, you, you know, you, you have to come from a place of helping and of service. And we were, we were helping them with their own marketing. But again, that helped us with our marketing too. So that was a big part of it. I'm so curious and you don't have to go into it now, but I'm dying to see what happens when you create your online platform for this, because how do you recreate the, the bar and the vibes and the like, it's kind of fun to go to this really cool, like hip um, craft show online, <laughs> you know? That's a great question. And I've been really following what other events are doing because I think now there's a ton of opportunity and a lot of events are shifting and a girlfriend of mine, she, she was supposed to go to Burning Man this summer and we were hanging out on Friday. She was like, Oh, I have to get home because I have a Burning Man party. <laughs> I was like, what? A yeah. Burning Man party on? And she's like, Oh, I have to put on my costume and get ready. I was like, okay, that's so interesting. So I haven't touched base with her since, but I'm curious to see how that Burning Man community is doing something online because there's a lot of possibilities. Yeah, there is. So, well, I'll be keeping my my eyes peeled to see how you how you do that because that sounds really cool, um, cutting edge. So how? Yeah, it's what you, do, you know, <laughs> yeah, you have to. Yeah, exactly. If you're gonna if you're gonna pull through this and 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 keep doing your thing, how do you stay in alignment with your customers and your clients? How do you make sure that what you're offering them continues to resonate with them? Ah. Uh, it can be challenging the bigger your business grows, to be honest, yeah. because at first when it was my brother and I running it, it was just the two of us, like my mom and dad would help at the front door, mm -hmm. but it really was just a very small business. And then as it grew, I brought on different staff and team members. And at one point, and I've been doing this for 11 years. So there was a point kind of that sticky middle where I felt like I kind of checked out a bit. Like I just wanted to try different things. And because I'm someone who likes to start new things all the time, like that, that perseverance of doing one thing all the time, like I just, I don't know, I got a bit disengaged and, and it really, I felt it after a while for sure. And it's a, it's, it's a balance too, because you're trying to scale and grow a business. So by doing so, you have to take a step back. Because if you're going to allow anyone else in to run your business, you have to give them the power and you have to give them, you know, some autonomy. It, it's like a kite. You've got to give them strength so they can fly too. Uh, and, and I mean, not to get too into stories 
too, because they're not super positive, but I did learn the hard way that you can't give away too much power because that can bite you in the ass and be, be detrimental to your business because not, no one's going to have the same vision you do. And you know, that's fine, but you have to be careful, like how much you give and how soon you give it. And like, trusting that the person's going to execute and checking in because sometimes when you're an entrepreneur and you're just exhausted and you're burnt out, you're like, okay, here you go. Just run with it. And it can be tempting just to like go on a trip, go to Bali, write a book, like all these things I, I was doing. And then it's like, okay, no, this is not what I wanted. This is not my intention of how I want to grow this business. So it's a balance and I've learned it over the years, but I feel right now I'm in a good spot, like with the community and I'm more involved. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't think anyone has it totally figured out, but I do know in order to grow, you have to, because that the whole saying like your business is your baby. I think that's true to a certain extent, but just like a baby or a child, it's, it's not like you have, you know, once it gets to be a teenager and early twenties, you have to really allow that, that child, that, that human to, to expand on its own. And a business is exact same in so many ways. Wow. You know, I haven't, I've heard your business is your baby metaphor, obviously so many times, but I haven't exactly. really given that much thought to mm -hmm it being its own entity that needs to grow and change and evolve independently of you with your guidance. Um, and that's yeah. basically what you're saying, which is amazing. And if your business truly is channeled, which I, you know, that's my hope and dream for myself as well as my clients and everybody and the, all the entrepreneurs of all the lands uh, is that we have <laughs> businesses that are in service to the, to the planet and to the universe and to humanity. Um, and if that's true and it is an entity in and of itself, um, how cool is it to think about it that way, that it is going to evolve independently of us with our loving parental guidance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. And when you bring in these other people, it's like, it's up to you to train them properly. And I think that's something that can be really hard, especially when you're new to leadership and you're new to having staff working with you. And, and because I started Beauty Belts when I was still in university, I really don't have a lot of job experience or, you know, working in the corporate world, which I think is a blessing and a curse. Like at first, in my mid twenties, I went through a bit of a crisis where I felt super self-conscious about not having all this experience. But I think not having that experience has also given me my edge because I'm not, I don't have any like past, past drama of dealing with all these stuff and like projecting that onto people. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty new and fresh to all of it. Uh, but yeah, I think it's also like, no one knows how to run your business. Like you might not even know how to run your business. And I love that idea of that entity. It's like allowing it to, to emerge and, and your business will tell you what it wants and needs as well. Yeah. So cool. Um, what kind of rituals and routines help you show up for your, for your business and your customers and your audience? Well, every day, almost every day. <laughs> I, I've been meditating for a really long time. I, I do something called Transcendental Meditation mm -hmm. or TM. Mm -hmm. However, I've been really into the Headspace app lately. Mm -hmm. I just, I like how it tracks it and I like a little bit of the guided meditation. So I've been doing that every day. I also have a five minute journal. I like to have a smoothie. Um, and actually with COVID, I feel like I have a lot more time to do all these things because sometimes like if I have an early morning meeting, I'm like rushing out the door and, and I definitely think routine is so important to just set your mindset and to just, I don't know, position you in a place of, of power and a place of just feeling really strong because sometimes it's like, okay, well, meditating, it feels like you're just like wasted time sitting there and not doing anything. It's like, you could be productive, but it's, it's, it's incredible. Like when you don't do it, how much you feel it. Oh my gosh. It's true. Yeah. Um, it's mission critical for me. <laughs> and I, yeah. You meditate yeah. every day too. I, yeah, well, when I don't, I feel it. I know it's when, I know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I set my alarm for 5 a.m. every morning and, uh, wow. if I, and then I don't get up my kid until 7 a.m. So I've got solid two hours set aside for um, coffee, meditation, yoga, dancing around the house, watching YouTube videos, whatever it is, but meditation damn well better be in there. <laughs> That's amazing. That's awesome. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, which means I have to go to bed by nine. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna ask, like, okay, so you go to bed by nine. That's the secret. I know. I know. I was wondering how people get up so early, but yeah, I guess you just have to train yourself. Yeah, and um, when I when I get off of that, which I did this week, I think since I had a, a birthday celebration um, on Saturday night, and I stayed up a little later than usual, which means eleven. Um, eleven. <laughs> <laughs> a party animal. So I had a hard time going to bed um, at my normal time these last few nights. Um, and so I didn't wake up at five and I could feel it like, oh my God, all day long. So anyway, yeah, mission critical. Um, what's your next level? And I mean, we've already answered this a little bit, but I'm super curious, like right now, what, what, how are you planning to reach even more people with your, with your products? I'm really focused on this idea of thought leadership and using my ideas and all that my experience to be able to teach and that's why I'm creating my course like this this first course is more of a beta like it's just a six week every Monday for an hour and a half small group because I'm, I'm figuring out what people need as well and I think that's the best way to teach I mean I have my own thoughts and ideas but one thing I learned from writing my book is you don't necessarily want to teach to your peers and to yourself and that's a trap you can get into and when I took a step back, because like with my book, I was learning so many new things. I'm like, oh, that needs to go in the book, and that needs to go in the book. And then finally my editor, I was driving her crazy. She's like, no, Jenna, this book is the first book. Like, it doesn't have to be like to impress your friends and your peer group and you know, people that you think are, are like smarter than you. Like, just there's, you serve more when you, when you come from that place of like, what do the people need? Like, how do I touch as many people as possible? And when you look at some of, um, I guess the self-help for lack of a better word, the self-help authors, I'm sure they're teaching to themselves like five years ago or one year ago or 10 years ago. And with the course development, it's like, where, where can I help? And I think a trap, another trap that, that thought leadership can, can lead you down is not knowing enough. It's like, okay, well, I'll teach something when I know more, but that's never ending and we're always evolving. And I think the most effective courses are actually sometimes the simplest that just have these ideas and, and they go really deep with them as opposed to just like offering way too much because it's just overwhelming to people. Absolutely. So this new course that's coming out is showing um, and helping um, people create sort of their, what their like hobbies into businesses? Is that sort of how you would describe it or how would you tagline it? I would tagline it is like how you would turn your ideas into reality because you could already be running a successful business, but that okay. next step or that next thing that you want to do. And it's amazing what can trip us up. And a lot of times we, we underestimate and overestimate at the same time. And what I mean by that is, is like the resistance can take up so much time and so much space. And have you read that the war of art by Stephen Pressfield? I haven't, but I'm familiar with it. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen the cliff notes version. Yeah. It's a, it's an outstanding book. I really resonate yeah. with the message because the more you want to do something, the more that resistance comes up. And I really feel that it's, there, there's the duality. It's like, you really want to do something. You're so excited but then the resistance is going to be even stronger. So it's almost like this dance that you need to navigate and getting through it. You, you can get stuck in your head so easily. So the course is really offering tools and techniques that I've used when I've had those challenges because I've had many as I've scaled my business and also some of these other things like even launching Conscious Lab where I'm, I'm here right now. Like sometimes with the space, I'm like, I still don't know quite what the space is. And especially now we can't have events here. But it's like, okay, well, what's getting in the way? So I feel like anyone can benefit, especially now from this idea of making something happen because it's so empowering. And I, I know like when I have stuff, it's almost like idea constipation. <laughs> like when you have all these ideas within you and you're not letting them out, they can clog you up and it can really be this stifling kind of negative energy um, because I think that's one of the biggest fears for, for, for humanity is not living up to our potential and to, to die with things still within us that we wanted to create. Um, so it's just allowing people a roadmap on how to, how to get through it and how to navigate. Beautiful. 
How can people find you and your beautiful offerings? <laughs> well, right now, well, for the course, I'm going to also offer one that's not live. Like this one through, is through Zoom. But my websites are jennaherbert.com, makeitshow.ca, consciouslab.ca, and then Instagram associates with all those sites too. Beautiful. We'll make sure to have those links in the show notes. Awesome. Um, and then I have one more question for you. Sure. How do you stay focused and aligned, especially now with this craziness in the world, so that you're not spreading yourself so thin and missing out on what matters most, which is your own personal um, growth, spirituality, and self-care? <laughs> uh, I think it's just listening to your body. And some days I can work really hard and I'm fine and I'm good and I feel awesome. And then some days I can just work a little bit and I find it really draining and yeah especially being pregnant like it's, it's definitely takes a toll on your energy levels for sure but I, I try and live like in the light and what I mean by that is like levity and fun and being kind of silly like I try not to take things too seriously I've always had that mentality and I find when I get too serious like I hate how that feels and so I try to just like bop around like you said you, you dance in the morning which is awesome and just that just getting the stuff out is really important. And um, yeah, just trying to have that perspective. It's easier said than done some days. But I think I, I, I try more than ever to just do things I really enjoy doing. And that concept can be quite challenging. I feel it's like, okay, well, if I, if I love it so much, then how could I possibly make money doing it? But that's the secret sauce. It's like if you love something, that energy you put into it, you, you will make money. Like I just think that's how currency and I think that's how abundance works. And there's no reason that booty bells, like at one point I was selling to 120 stores. Like I grew it into a fairly big business. And with Make It, like it just blows my mind the things I've been able to do. And I haven't really had like these huge these huge goals around them either. It's just, I put my passion and I directed it and then it just all aligned. So, I mean, that's why I love all the hippie spiritual stuff because there's definitely something to it. It works. Yeah. It does work. <laughs> <laughs> totally works. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that everything that you just said right there, there's a lot, there's a lot of beautiful, um, jewels of wisdom in there about, um, loving what you do, bringing joy to your life, bringing levity to your life, um, all of that and to your business. And so i um, super grateful that you shared all of that and um, that you came onto the show. So thank you for coming. And well, my pleasure, Sarah. And you ask amazing questions. Like I do a lot of podcasts and those ones I was like, whoa, okay, I have to go deep. It was great. It feels like Light. therapy. I feel much lighter now. <laughs> all right, go dance it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to y'all for listening and uh, we'll see you next week.